Aloha, this is Dr. Stanley Kim again. I'm still working at North Hawaii Community Hospital. Today, we will discuss gastric cancer. Gastric cancer used to be the most common cancer worldwide in the past, but now its incidence is decreasing. Thanks to the inventor who introduced refrigerators, now we eat fresh foods because the salted or pickled foods increase the risk of gastric cancer. In addition, discovery of stomach infection with H. pylori and the treatment of those bacteria decreased the uh, incidence of gastric cancer. However, we are seeing more and more cancer arising from gastric and the esophageal junction, so-called GE junction, mostly due to higher incidence of S reflux nowadays. Regarding treatment, we've seen tremendous improvement for the past five to 10 years. And we'll discuss more in detail. And thank you for watching. Mahalo. Gastric cancer was one of the most common cancer worldwide, but now the overall instance is decreasing, probably due to wide use of refrigerators and the discovery of H. pylori infection of the stomach. Because preserved food in salts or pickled foods are associated with a higher incidence of gastric cancer. And H. pylori has known to be the contributing factor of stomach cancer and the stomach lymphoma. It's more common in Asian countries and the South Africa, and it's less common in whites and Africans. Please look at this picture. The stomach mostly occurs in the uh, uh, body and the distal stomach, but the instance of proximal stomach, especially gastroesophageal junction area, is increasing dramatically. I also want you to know D1 and the D2 lymph nodes. D1 lymph nodes are perigastric lymph nodes just around the stomach, like a lymph nodes of great curvature, lex curvature, cardia, and the pyloric lymph nodes. D2 lymph nodes are a little bit uh, further away. That includes the uh, celiac lymph nodes, splenic artery lymph nodes, splenic hyaluronic lymph nodes, and the uh, hepatic common hepatic artery lymph nodes. When the patients have a surgery, the surgeon removed the, uh, the stomach as well as the D1 and the D2 lymph nodes. There are two main histologic variants, intestinal types and uh, diffuse type. Intestinal type has a similar morphology of intestinal adenocarcinoma. Diffuse type is more commonly seen in inherited gastric cancer. The risk factor of intestinal type gastric cancer include H. pylori infection, atrophic gastritis, gastric ulcer, pernicious anemia, and the viral reflux. It's proposed that H. pylori infection causes chronic inflammation resulting in epithelial cell damage, which leads to intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, which may uh, progresses to the uh, cancer cells. Atrophic gastritis is often due to high salt diet, and uh, we can expect the uh, decreased acid production from uh, atrophic epithelial gastric cells, which increase the uh, gastric pH environment, allowing bacterial overgrowth, which convert dietary nitrates to carcinogenic and nitrosyl compounds. About 25% of gastric cancer patients have a gastric ulcer, and this gastric ulcer increases the risk of gastric cancer, but not the benign peptic duodenal ulcer. Pernicious anemia patients have atrophic gastritis, and the bile reflux can neutralize the uh, acid uh, of the stomach, increasing the uh, gastric pH uh, environment. The pathogenesis of Diffuse type gastric cancer is different. Uh, most of the uh, sporadic diffuse type cancer is associated with somatic mutation of cell adhesion protein called cadherin, cadherin-1. Uh, abbreviation is CDH1. Because of defective cell adhesion protein, the cells become poorly cohesive and they become infiltrating. It includes the signet ring cell carcinoma. 
the primary cancer cells are signet ring cells accounting more than 50% of all cells, and it has a poor prognosis due to frequent lymph node metastasis and the resistance to chemotherapy. Please look at this picture. It has a characteristic uh, a feature. In cytoplasm, you can see the mucinous goblet, and the nucleus is kind of eccentrically uh, located, resembling signet ring. Diffuse type gastric cancer is seen in Hereditary diffuse gastric cancer as well is due to germline mutation of CDH1 or CTNA1 gene. I like to mention that Epstein-Barr virus can cause gastric cancer. It's called Epstein-Barr virus associated gastric cancer, accounting for about 10% or less of all gastric cancer and is more common in young male. The tissue shows nodular and the lymphoid stroma, so it's not an infiltrating type. The cells are commonly overexpressed the PDL1, so it indicates the uh, a better prognosis because of responsiveness to the immunotherapy. Most gastric cancers are sporadic, but about 10% of patients have a family history of gastric cancer, and a few percent of patients have hereditary gastric cancer syndrome. Among several of those hereditary gastric cancer syndrome, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, HDGC, is the well-known and the mostly studied. It's due to germline mutation of cadherin 1, CDH1 gene, or less commonly, CTNA1 genes inherited in the autosomal dominant pattern. Patients with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in CDH1 or CTWN1 may need to have a prophylactic gastrectomy because 70% of them develop gastric cancer in their lifetime. If variants of uncertain significance, gastrectomy is not necessary, but they need to have a very close endoscopic surveillance. Women with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic CDH1 variant have high risk of lobular breast cancer. So intense surveillance with MRI breast and the prophylactic mastectomy or chemo prevention are considered. What's the criteria to test for the uh, genetic test of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer? In the family, two gastric cancers at any age, and at least one confirmed diffuse gastric cancer. And the diffuse gastric cancer diagnosed age less than 40s, regardless of family history. And the personal or family history of diffuse gastric cancer and the lobular breast cancer, which at least one diagnosed at less than, uh, age less than 50 years old. Other less uh, common or studied are gastrogastric adenocarcinoma and the proximal polyposis of the stomach, GAPPS. There are no mutation gene found yet. Familial intestinal gastric cancer, no mutational mutated gene found yet. Other hereditary cancer syndromes that increase the risk of gastric cancer include Lynch syndrome, familial adenomatosis polyposis, L. From any syndrome, Puig's Jeffer syndrome, Coden syndrome. Patients with early gastric cancer may not have any symptoms, but as disease progresses, they can have weight loss, abdominal pain, nausea, swallowing difficulties, early satiety, GI bleeding, melana, iron deficiency, anemia, and when they metastasize, uh, they may produce the uh, characteristic metastatic signs like a verco nose, which is left a supraclavicular lymph node metastasis, Irish node, it's a left axillary node metastasis, Sister Mary Joseph's nodule due to metastasis to umbilicus. And when they metastasize to the peritoneum, the patients develop ascites, 
And the Krukenborg tumor is uh, uh, interesting. Uh, it's due to metastasis to ovary, which is often bilateral and large. And when the liver metastasis occurs, patients develop jaundice or hepatomegaly. Paraneoplastic syndrome can be include diffuse seborrheic kurtosis, acanthosis nigricans. Please look at this photo. The acanthosis nigricans is the hyperpigmentation in this uh, skin folds area, like armpit, neck, uh, groins. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and the hypercoagulability state causing uh, venous thromboembolism is called the Trozo syndrome. Polyarthritis nodosa has been reported. As we studied last slide, Verco's nose, it's a left a supraclavicular lymph node metastasis, very uh, characteristic of gastric, but it can be from other GI cancer. Irish nose, left axillary, but it also can be from uh, breast cancer. And the system Mary Joseph nodule due to umbilicus uh, metastasis. Kruckenberg tumor, often bilateral and large due to uh, metastasis to the ovaries. And the bloomous shelf, you can feel the shelf like a, uh, a by uh, rectal examination, is due to metastasis in the pelvic cul de sac area. For diagnosis, endoscopy and the biopsy is done, which is the most accurate diagnostic test. Please look at this picture. Malignant ulcer is often shown as an ulcerative mass, irregular thickened ulcer edge with the folds surrounding the ulcer crater are nodular. Usually five to seven biopsies are recommended when cancer is suspected for accurate diagnosis and the gastric mucosal biopsy for H. pylori should be done. If it's positive, a treat for eradication. If it, even if it's negative, H. pylori serology is recommended to confirm as biopsy may be a false negative. For technique, jumbo forceps, stripe and the bite, and the four brushing techniques may be used. Lionitis plastica, meaning the leather bottle stomach, is a very aggressive cancer and the gastric cancer cells are infiltrating in the submucosa or muscularis and the lining may look normal. Once the diagnosis of gastric cancer is made with the endoscopy and biopsy, then staging workup is done usually with a CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis and the suspicious lesion for metastasis is biopsy. It's not very accurate in assessment of depth of invasion and the small lymph node metastasis less than 8 mm and in detecting peritoneal metastasis. And the PET CT scan is done if CT are equivocal for metastatic disease. And it also may be done to confirm negative CT findings before surgery. We need to know that diffuse type gastric cancer may not be FDG avid and also only 50% sensitive in detecting peritoneal metastasis. If the CT or PET CTs are negative, then endoscopic ultrasound is necessary to accurately assess the depth of invasion and lymph node metastasis status. And the fine needle aspiration of suspicious lymph nodes is done at the same time. Before surgery or neoadjuvant chemotherapy, staging laparoscopy is often done in order to rule out the peritoneal metastasis and uh, routinely the peritoneal washing and the cytology is done at the same time. When do you do the staging laparoscopy? It's still controversial, uh, but if endoscopy ultrasound shows very early stage like a T1A, then no laparoscopy is necessary. European Society of Medical Oncology recommends laparoscopy for T2 or a higher stage but Sloan Kettering cancer only recommends when the T stage is over T3. Tumor markers are not routinely used, but can be helpful in assessing the response of treatments if positive. That includes CEA, CA19-9, CA125, and the F, uh, AFP. The AF, uh, F, AFP positive gastric cancer has a poor prognosis. Now let's look at the clinical stage. Please look at this picture. TIS, 
it's carcinoma in situ or intraepithelial tumor or high-grade dysplasia. T1 tumor invades the lamina propria or muscularis mucosa or submucosa, but not the uh, muscular layer yet. T2 tumor invades the muscularis propria. Those are main muscular layer. T3 tumor penetrates the sub serosal connective tissue without invasion of the uh, visceral peritoneum or adjacent structures. T4 tumor invades the visceral peritoneum at the end of in the lining here, the serosa or adjacent structure. Lymph nodes, no lymph nodes metastasis is N0. N1 metastasis means one or two lymph node, a perigastric lymph node metastasis. N2, three to six lymph node metastasis. N3 is more than seven lymph node metastasis. And M0 means no distant metastasis, M1 uh, distant metastasis. The clinical stage is made before surgery, but more accurately, pathological staging is done after the surgery. I just want to mention that the stage 1A means uh, tumor invading uh, uh, up to submucosa, but with no lymph node metastasis. Stage 1B means a tumor, a T1 tumor with a, a N1 lymph nodes, one or two lymph nodes metastasis or T2, tumor invades the mus muscle layer, but without lymph node metastasis. We had made a diagnosis and the stage is the gastric cancer. Now, how we treat the patient? With the upfront surgery or upfront chemotherapy and the surgery, which is called the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. For resectable gastric cancer, Neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery is better than surgery alone in progression-free survival and the overall survival. And also, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is better than uh, adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery in uh, disease progression-free survival, but not the overall survival, though. Many patients may not complete full dose of chemotherapy after surgery due to complication or patients weak after the surgery. So there is a, some advantage of giving chemo beforehand. And also unresectable, locally advanced cancer may respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the tumor shrink, which converts the uh, unresectable tumor to resectable cancer. Upfront surgery and the adjuvant chemotherapy is acceptable for early gastric cancer like a T1 or non-bulky T2, T3 without lymph node metastasis. But mostly, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery is preferred, uh, for example, T2, N0 or higher risk cases like a T3, T4 or lymph node positive uh, tumors, cancers. Esophageal gastric junction, junction cancer is usually treated with a neoadjuvant concurrent chemoradiation therapy. I will uh, uh, discuss later. T1, N0. Those are very superficial tumor without lymph node metastasis. Do not need to have a gastrectomy. It's a candidate for submucosal dissection and endoscopy mucosal resection. The indication is uh, indications are a mucosal tumor without ulceration, tumor size less than two centimeter, and differentiated histology, and no lymphovascular invasion. The end block resection is more likely with the endoscopic uh, submucosal dissection than endoscopic mucosal resection. For neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there are several uh, protocols. FLOT, it's more for the uh, fit patients without core mobility because it's pretty strong. Give a four cycles before surgery and the four cycles after the surgery. Uh, consist of docetaxel, oxaloplatin, nucleovarin, 5-FU, continuous infusion. And the Folfox uh, can be given for less fit patients or older patients, or KPOX is also can be used.
again the four cycles before and the four cycles after the surgery and the mild chemotherapy the garamon uh, protocol just using flocovarin and the 5-FU is given for uh, less fit patients for surgery total gastrectomy or subtotal gastrectomy can be done the total gastrectomy is for tumor located in the proximal uh, stomach or mid gastric location and the infiltrating cancer uh, needs to have a total gastrectomy because it infiltrates through the whole gastric uh, wall subtotal gastrectomy has a di distal subtotal gastrectomy and uh, uh, proximal subtotal gastrectomy distal subtotal gastrectomy for distal uh, tumors of the stomach is pretty good because it has less complication than total gastrectomy and the five-year overall survival is same as the total gastrectomy proximal subtotal gastrectomy can cause esophagitis reflux esophagitis and also anatomical stenosis but newly developed double track technique can reduce the acid reflux so it's often preferred for GE junction uh, cancer. The indication of surgery are for, for patients who do not have the followings like a distant metastasis, major vessel invasion, encasement or occlusion of the hepatic, celiac or proximal splenic arteries, bulky or fixed adenopathy to pancreatic heads, lymph node metastasis to peripancreatic aortic cavall, mediastinal or porta hepatis areas and the, we know the lionitis plastica is diffusely infiltrating tumor and uh, this is not a really surgical case but with the uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, patients may be a candidate surgery later on once the tumor is all eradicated with the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy resection of distal pancreas or splenectomy are not routinely done anymore open gastrectomy is preferred but laparoscopic or robotic surgery appears to provide a similar outcome with a less hospital stay or uh, blood loss during the surgery lymph node dissection is necessary i described that d1 lymph nodes are those lymph nodes around the stomach perigastric lymph nodes d2 lymph nodes are a little bit further away like a uh, celiac lymph nodes, splenic artery lymph nodes, splenic portal lymph nodes, uh, hepatic, uh, common hepatic artery lymph nodes. And the, both D1 and the D2 lymph nodes need to be dissected. And the, at least the 15 lymph nodes need to be dissected during that surgery. And also is expected to see better outcome when surgery done by experienced hands at the high volume centers. D3 lymph node dissection is not recommended. D3 lymph nodes uh, means the, the lymph nodes farther away like a, a retroperitoneal lymph nodes, like a periaortic lymph nodes or mediastinal lymph nodes or also the portipatis lymph nodes. After new adjuvant chemotherapy, we like to see the response and uh, we stage that tumor using prefix Y and the P means pathology. So after new adjuvant chemotherapy and the surgery, you can stage the tumor after those treatment using YP uh, prefix before the TMM stage. For example, about 30 to 40 percent, up to 60 percent of patients respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And the surgery showed pathological complete response. And we use YP T0, YP N0 because those are after neoadjuvant and the surgical pathological staging T0, neoadjuvant and the surgical pathological staging N0. And those pathological complete response, YPT0, YPN0, is associated with improved survival. And the residual lymph node metastasis is the only multivariate prognostic factor associated with a poor prognosis. Even uh, tumor responded uh, to chemotherapy. 
Additional adjuvant chemotherapy improved the survival to responders, but non-responders to neoadjuvant chemotherapy did not benefit from additional uh, chemotherapy with the same chemotherapy regimen. What about using different chemotherapy to non-responders or maybe using chemoradiotherapy? Uh, well, it's possible, but it's an individual decision. In fact, many patients cannot tolerate post-operative chemo or chemoradiation therapy. When patient had an upfront surgery without neoadjuvant therapy, adjuvant chemotherapy, which is the post-operative chemotherapy, is indicated for uh, pathological stage 2 and uh, 3. We use KPOX or FALPOX for six months. In Asian countries, S1 plus minus docetaxel is used for one year. Adjuvant chemotherapy for stage 1b, including T2N0 and the T1N1, is a controversial. They, they may not need adjuvant chemotherapy when all D2 lymphoma dissection is done. But T1N1 may need of adjuvant chemotherapy because it's lymph node uh, involvement. T2N0 may need adjuvant chemotherapy with a high risk features like a poorly differentiated histology, high grade lymphovascular or neural invasions, or young age less than age 50, which is consistent with the NCCN guideline. What about adjuvant chemoradiation therapy? Many clinical studies. Uh, showed uh, no benefit of chemoradiation therapy over chemotherapy alone. But when the patients have an uh, incomplete resection uh, or positive lymph node disease, uh, adjuvant chemoradiation therapy may be considered. In this case, we always give a chemotherapy for two cycles before radiation and the concurrent chemoradiation and the followed by uh, uh, another four cycles of chemotherapy. I would like to describe the uh, gastric esophageal junction adenocarcinoma separately because the incidence of this GE junction adenocarcinoma is rising very rapidly nowadays. It's mostly due to gastroesophageal acid reflux disease, GERD, which causes Barrett's esophagus. It is the uh, metaplasia of the distal uh, esophageal uh, linings from squamous cell to columnar epithelium by chronic inflammation. It's more common in the white men, old age, and also the cancer develops when the buried esophagus involves the long segment of distal esophagus, more than three centimeters. American Joint Commission of Cancer Staging Definition of uh, Gastroesophageal Junction Cancer is when the uh, tumor epicenter locates no more than two centimeter from GE junction, it is called esophageal cancer. But when the tumor epicenter is more than two centimeter from GE junction, and it's, it's a uh, gastric cancer. And also there are uh, another um, classification of GE junctions. It's called the seaward type one, two, three. Seaward type one, means the tumor locates uh, proximally from the G junction uh, one from one centimeter to five centimeter. And the seaward type two is around the uh, GE junction, uh, proximally one centimeter and the distally two centimeter from GE junction. And the seaward type three is more uh, proximal gastric cancer. It's uh, uh, located distally from two centimeter to five centimeter from GE junction. This GE junction cancer, especially um, seaward type one and twos are related to a GERD as reflux, but this though, the proximal gastric cancer, for example, seaward type three, is actually more related to classical uh, gastric cancer, which is associated with H. pylori infection, uh, and the pi H. pylori produces urease, which converts the urea to ammonia, raising the uh, pH. So this gastric cancer or proximal gastric cancer is related to uh, high P 
pH level because of H. pylori. But uh, in the higher seaward type 1 and two, type 2 tumors are related to acid reflux and the low pH level. Although Barrett's esophagus raised risk, only 0.12% of Barrett's esophagus patients develop a GE junction cancer annually. So many studies showed no benefit of, of close surveillance endoscopy. So when dysplasia is found by biopsy, then you give the uh, a proton uh, pump inhibitors for two months and repeat endoscopy and biopsy annually. When it still shows dysplasia, then patients need to have endoscopic radiofrequency ablation therapy or photodynamic treatment, argon plasma coagulation therapy. I like to mention that high fiber diet also uh, uh, protective for uh, protective and the lower the risk of GE junction adenocarcinoma. In detecting metastatic disease, PET CT is more accurate than CT scan. And when PET CT or CT showed no signs of distant metastasis, then endoscopic ultrasound is done. It is very accurate in uh, staging the T and the N. And the fine needle aspiration is done for suspicious mediastinal and the perigastric lymph nodes. This endoscopic procedure is used as a therapy to, uh, to have a mucosal resection for early tumors, TIS, T1 lesions. And the diagnostic laparoscopy is often done to detect intraperitoneal metastasis because those PET CT or CT may not show the uh, uh, intraperitoneal metastasis. But this is controversial because it's, it's a kind of an invasive procedure. But it can be done before neoadjuvant therapy or large tumors T3, 4, or uh, lower-lying uh, lying GE junction tumors, like a seaward 2 or 3 types. According to NCCN guideline, this uh, staging laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy, is an optional procedure. For European society, uh, it's recommended for all T3, 4, or infiltrating gastric cardiac tumors. When the patients have a celiac or a supraclavicular lymph node metastasis, you may say, oh, this is distant metastasis. It's not a curable disease anymore. But actually not. About 25% uh, survives over five years with the resection of those tumors. So don't be discouraged and try to do uh, ablate or take care of this celiac or supraclavicular lymph nodes. For surgery of GE junction tumors, uh, please look at these pictures. You can, the patients can have esophagectomy with a proximal gastrectomy or esophagectomy with a total gastrectomy. And then those D1 and the D2 lymph node dissections are included. At least 15 lymph nodes resections are required and the pretty good surgical margins like a four centimeter gastric margins and the five centimeter uh, esophageal margins. I mentioned the surgery for G junction adenocarcinoma in the previous slide, but most patients undergo neoadjuvant concurrent chemo radiation therapy before surgery because this neoadjuvant uh, therapy improved the survival than surgery alone. And the chemo radiation is better than uh, just chemotherapy. Uh, in terms of uh, response rate, but not the overall survival. For certain patients who cannot have a surgery, curative chemoradiation therapy without surgery was not inferior than chemoradiation followed by surgical resection. After neoadjuvant therapy, PET CT is usually done before surgery to make sure no new metastatic disease has developed because metastatic disease prohibits the surgery. And after neoadjuvant concurrent chemo radiation therapy and the surgery, and when the patients still have a residual disease, then adjuvant immunotherapy with the nivolumab is indicated, regardless of PDL1 score. The study showed the uh, uh, disease progression free survival was doubled. After neoadjuvant chemotherapy, not the chemo radiation therapy, and the surgery, and the patients have a residual disease, 
then adjuvant chemo radiation or same chemo is used because nivolumab immunotherapy is not has not been approved by FDA yet, but I, I think it will be approved as the uh, randomized studies underway right now. Upfront the surgery is an option if resectable too, uh, and then for the uh, tumor T2 N12 or bigger tumor T3 4 tumors then adjuvant chemoradiation therapy or adjuvant chemotherapy is indicated. But for T2 N0, no adjuvant therapy is indicated unless patients have a high risk, like a tumor has a poorly differentiated histology or uh, lymphovascular invasion, etc. We routinely check the HER2 for uh, esophageal gastric or esophageal gastric junction tumor. What if they have a positive HER2 uh, receptor uh, mutation? Then can we add the Herceptin to neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy? Yes. Uh, the study was done, but unfortunately, it did not improve the uh, overall survival. So we don't use the Herceptin. Uh, we don't add the septin to uh, neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy. I'd like to introduce a landmark study published very recently. It's a uh, KLGB8803 trial for patients with esophageal and the GE junction uh, adenocarcinoma. Patients randomized to have either Folfox or uh, carboplatin and Paxil. Then PET CT is done uh, at four to six weeks. When Folfox patients responded, the respond means SUV decreased by over 35% in PET scan. Received the 5-FU and the oxaloplatin concurrently with the irradiation therapy. And the carbotaxel responders received weekly carbo and the taxel. If they didn't respond to either Folfox or carbotaxel, then they cross over to the other chemotherapy, chemoradiation therapy regimen. The results was very impressive. The Folfox responders, about 40% of patients have a pathological complete response. Folfox non-responders still 18% have a pathological response complete. But the carbotaxel responders have a pathologic complete response in 14%, it's much less. And the uh, crossover patients who did not respond to carbotaxel achieved a 20% uh, pathologic complete response when they received full 5-FU oxaloplatin and the concurrent radiation therapy. And the median 5.2 year over survival for pet responders was almost 50 months. And the median survival for fall fox responders was not reached. And the more than 50% patients are still living uh, over 5.2 years. I think the patients with the G junction cancer should receive that. Uh, all for six, followed by concurrent uh, chemoradiation therapy. When the patients have a locally advanced unresectable disease or metastatic uh, cancer, then tumor needs to be analyzed for HER2, PDL1, MMR, MSIH, and the tumor mutational burden TMB. When the tumor has HER2 uh, mutation, then combination of pembrolizumab and the trazumab along with the platinum and 5-FU, mostly K-POX, show the uh, impressive objective response rate, 74.4%, with the complete response rate, 11.3%. About 20% of gastric or G junction at the carcinoma have a HER2 positive. When they fail this first line HER2 targeted therapy, then a second line of um, trastuzumab deruxtecan is used. It's, it's generic, the uh, brand name is in HER2. When the 
tumor is HER2 negative, but PDL1 uh, combined positive score is high, more than 10, then pembrolizumab monotherapy is good, unless the tumor is very bulky. In those cases, you add the chemotherapy to the uh, uh, pembrolizumab. When the tumor is HER2 negative and the PDL1 CPS is above 5 uh, and less than 10, then nivolumab with the chemotherapy improved overall survival. When the tumor is HER2 negative and the PDL1 score is low, is over 1 and below 5, then either uh, pembrolizumab or chemotherapy is used, not the combination. Combination of pembrolizumab and chemo did not show any benefit. When the tumor is HER2 negative and the PDL1 negative, then chemotherapy is used. But nivolumab mono, uh, monotherapy is approved regardless of PDL1 in Japan after patient's uh, tumor progressed uh, over one previous chemotherapy. It's uh, shown in attraction three studies, but this study was done in South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. We don't know uh, the uh, efficacy in uh, Western uh, white American or African patients. Combination of chemo and the pembrolizumab showed a survival benefit in squamous cell carcinoma only, not the uh, not proven adenocarcinoma. Further, uh, third line treatment include the uh, lone cert. And you can also use the uh, uh, ramucir ramucirumab, the ceramza, with and without paclitaxel or aratican weekly uh, paclitaxel or weekly nap paclitaxel. For palliative therapy, uh, palliative radiation or palliative gastric resection is sometimes used. This palliative gastric uh, radiation therapy is useful for gastric cancer bleeding or dysphagia due to obstruction, and also it relieves the pain. Endoscopic stent placement is used for obstructive disease like a GE junction or gastric outlet obstruction. Endoscopic laser relieves the suffered uh, dysphagia due to uh, obstruction. Laser photocoagulation or organ plasma coagulation or endoscopic hemospray is used for bleeding uh, control. When the patients have a severe pain or nausea or bleeding obstruction and even perforation, palliative gastric resection is indicated. Some studies showed improved survival than uh, just uh, no surgery or bypass surgery. However, when compared with the systemic chemotherapy, Palliative gastrectomy did not improve over survival. So it's not indicated for patients who undergoing uh, systemic chemotherapy or other uh, immunotherapy. And the palliative gastrogenostomy is done to relieve the gastric outlet obstruction. The five-year survival rate for stage one gastric cancer after the surgery, like a mucosal resection, approached the 100%, but stage two cancer, the five-year five -year survival rate is about 50-60%. Stage three, around 40%. Stage four, 10 to 15%. The follow-up for early gastric cancer include HNP and the blood test every three to six months for the first two years then every six months for years three to five, then annually. Endoscopy surveillance is done every six months for first year, then annually up to five years. The imaging studies, CT, MRI, PET scan are done as needed based on the suspicious symptoms and signs. This is the photo I took in Big Island, Hawaii, and I saw the sea of glass. My younger brother, who is a pastor said, the sea of glass means peace and comfort. I really like to have all cancer patients have the peace of mind and the physical comfort given by God. Thank you so much.